boa tarde, gente. É, primeiramente, desculpe pelo atraso, a gente estava só configurando algumas coisinhas aqui. Como vocês podem perceber, infelizmente, o François não pôde estar presente aqui no evento por causa da greve da Air France, que acabou impedindo a vinda dele. Ele estava com tudo planejado para vir e, de repente, de última hora, ele descobriu que o voo dele estava cancelado e ele não pôde vir para a conferência. Então, ele fez um esforço para que ele pudesse, pelo menos, fazer essa participação remota e pudesse falar aqui na conferência, para ele não perder essa oportunidade de falar sobre o WebTV aqui na conferência. Eu vou só fazer uma, falar um breve currículo do François e depois eu já passo a palavra para ele. O François Daost, ele é Cross Device Web App Developer do W3C. Ele lidera as discussões de desenvolvimento na convergência entre o WebTV no W3C, com foco específico em cenários multitela. Ele contribui para projetos financiados pela União Europeia, como Midscape, a parceria União Europeia-Brasil no projeto global ITV. O François é um, é um desenvolvedor de software com anos de experiência na construção de aplicações web multiplataforma. Ele se juntou ao W3C em novembro de 2007, onde ele participou do Working Group de Mobile Web Best Practices e do Interest Group Web TV e do Working Group de Real-Time Communications. Então, eu vou deixar aqui o François dar as boas-vindas e começar a sua apresentação. So, François, the stage is yours. Thank you. So, welcome, everyone. Oh, well, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, could you? Okay, thank you. Um, so I thank you, I guess, for the introduction. Um, so I did not understand everything, but I hear that the Air Force was mentioned some somehow within the talk. And uh, as you know, as you may know, Air Force is on strike, and unfortunately, they cancelled my flight. And I'm deeply sorry because I, I screwed up, and uh, the alternatives were not uh, compatible with the with my agenda next week. And I'm, uh, uh, I just couldn't be there with you. And I'm, I'm, I'm really, really sorry. It's the first time that uh, something like that ever happened to me. I hope it's going to be the last time. And I really apologize to conference organizer. So anyway, we will try to do it. Uh, of the Skype. It's a bit of an unusual exercise. Uh, I am in France. I am in Paris right now. I cannot prove it to you because what you see behind is actually my basement. That's where I work from. I work remotely from my basement. So as I didn't have any proof that I am in Paris, I thought maybe you would be interesting to see some nice pictures of Paris to start with. So for instance, you have the, well, of course, the oops. Just a second. So the, the Eiffel Tower is there. So this is, I, I live close to here. And of course you have the, the Arc de Triomphe and the Champs-Élysées, the famous avenue, avenue of the world. So anyway, that's all I have from Paris to show you. I'm afraid the rest of the talk, you will see my slides and the roof of my basement. Uh, so, um, I am really sorry that I, is dog around? So I don't have any audio feedback, but I, I think you've seen dog yesterday. So dog is a, here. okay, wonderful. So hello dog. Um, so probably no, dog no. already introduced to wonderful hello. <laughs> so uh, I apologize even more because I left you with dog and that's, uh, I mean, definitely something that I will never ever do that again, I promise. Uh, so anyway, I'm here to talk about the convergence between two initially separate worlds, the web and TV. Uh, it's an interesting convergence because I don't know, I suppose most of you are from some kind of development perspective. There are develop I expect you are developers or the like. Uh, I hope that's the case. Um, and it's a convergence where you may not be part of right now, meaning that web developers do not uh, necessarily develop TV applications for the time being, up until now, that is. Uh, I saw that the agenda was full of technical topics, technical talks around AngularJS, web components, that kind of thing. So I thought I would take a different approach here and try to tell you a kind of a, a story uh, some kind of a bedtime story. Um, 
so I'm going to switch to slides mode. I'm going to show you the slides. But now that I think about it, it may not be a good, very good idea what I did because um, uh, my slides are voluntarily uh, devoid of real content because the goal was to tell you a story. But since I'm not physically here, uh, I'm afraid you might fall asleep. I hope not. Let's see. So uh, trying to share my slide right now. Screen share, where is it? Can you see the slides correctly? Can you all raise your hand so that I see that you understand me correctly? Wonderful, that's <laughs> amazing. Uh, so uh, I, I, I will keep the, the current setting. I don't know if you see my slides uh, full screen, but uh, uh, at least I can still see the video. If I switch full screen on my computer, I would not be able to see you. Um, not being able to see you means I would be talking to my washing machine and my dryer, and that's a bit uh, strange, to say the least. So moving on, uh, if you lose me, uh, meaning uh, if, uh, if, uh, if I'm not clear, if the connection drops, uh, the key message here is that it's, uh, I suppose Doug told you yesterday that it's, uh, the, the web is fantastic and W3C is fantastic because you can contribute to W3C at any time and you can do, you can make things change and you can improve the web platform and it's just fantastic. My key message here is that it's all the more fantastic, all the more extraordinarily uh, that it is actually quite hard to build the web platform in practice, especially when you try to mix two words that are really apart, such as the web and TV together. So it's a complex world. Uh, it's a complex world that is worth looking at. Um, so we'll try to build a hybrid web and TV platform here. Uh, it's a kind of black construction game and uh, it's going to be fun, of course, I promise. Uh, so it's a storytelling, but I'm going to stick to some kind of a simple outline, uh, a possibly boring one. Uh, so I look at TV first, then I switch to the web. And actually, uh, even though it's a web conference, I will spend more less time on web than I spend on TV. But it's uh, it's on purpose because I think that's the you, you know the web better than uh, you may know TV, even if you use TV perhaps more than the web. But and then eventually I will take a look at how we can mix. Uh, TV and the web together and create uh, a fantastic new world called a uh, hybrid world, perhaps. Uh, so I don't know if I need to present W3C. I suppose Doug already do that, did that yesterday. Uh, so I'm not going to insist on that. Uh, it's a World Wide Web Consortium and we do web standards. It's a consortium, so many different people, many different companies joining the consortium from industry and research and and uh, actually individuals are, are, are as well. Uh, there are offices in many countries and you must know it since uh, the Bra Brazil is organizing the conference, the Brazil office is organizing that conference. So it's uh, uh, we are around the world and that's good. Only one web is the mantra. There's only one web. It's a philosophy. And uh, there's a global participation, but we'll get back to it. So, uh, our story starts with TV. So it's a, it's a story, so I'm probably going to omit a number of valuable details. Uh, I will also take some liberty with facts. I might even be entirely wrong because I was not born when TV was born. Uh, hopefully these uh, approximations will not change the uh, gist of the, of the message here. So anyway, so TV is old. I mean, things started uh, actually before 1950. Uh, but there, the, something happened during the 20th century, the Second World War, and actually the first one as well, and that kind of delayed things. So the deployment, the actual deployment of, of TV around the world, uh, is basically started after the Second World War. And so in Brazil, it's 1950, I think. We're talking about analog TV here, so it's uh, uh, just an analog signal, video and audio. Uh, so launching TV means a lot of energy and money uh, got spent on uh, infrastructure uh, to build, uh, to create uh, TV antennas and that kind of thing. 
So it has been a public thing pretty much everywhere in the world, meaning that the, the governments uh, who, uh, who, who designed the deployment of TV, who, who uh, handled that. Uh, and so, uh, actually, you, I, don't, I think that's still the case in Brazil. You, uh, in France, we still pay a tax for public TV. That's a public thing. When you receive, when you have a TV receiver, you you have to pay a tax. It's very important to realize that the uh, governments have a central place uh, in the deployment of TV. Without them, I mean, there wouldn't be any TV. And uh, it, it's important when we talk about the web and TV to remember that governments are there. What is also interesting is that there are there were a few analog TV systems uh, that got introduced throughout the world. Uh, in some areas, especially in Europe, uh, you even had two, or actually it may be the same thing in Brazil, you even had two systems in parallel, PAL and SICAM, for instance, uh, but there was no agreement for a, a common analog TV system uh, that would be the one and only one system uh, throughout the world. Uh, by, by, the way of, uh, by the way, SECAM is a, is a French technology. It is so French that the team who invented it uh, actually was led by a guy named Henri de France. Pretty French. So anyway, different systems. So actually what surprises me is uh, not that there were basically three main systems, but uh, it, what surprises me is that there were not more systems uh, throughout the world. Because as already stated, TV deployment has been done by government, and that means it has been done on a country per country basis, and it has been highly regulated by government. Um, so there are laws that describe how TV is supposed to work in Brazil, and there are laws that describe how TV is supposed to work in France. These laws are not the same, and the uh, requirement, the technical requirements in uh, both cases are not the same. And again, I already said it, it's very important to bear in mind that uh, we're talking about a local thing. I mean, the TV is everywhere, but it's a, a country on a country per country basis. So if I zoom out a bit and look at uh, analog TV from uh, very far above, uh, a rough definition of analog TV could be that it's a uh, uh, it's, a, it's a broadcast signal, so something arrives to my TV receiver. There are several channels, not too many, one, two, three, four, five, six, perhaps more, a bit more, but not more, not much more. And there's uh, an audio and video signal per channel. And that's about it. And that's what triggered the, uh, the TV remote, and uh, that's what made our lives um, for a number of years, of years. So uh, they, there's something pretty unique about TV, is that it creates a unique user experience uh, that has that has yet to be matched by any other system. It allows someone, a broadcaster in practice, to touch millions of people at the same time with audio and video. Even if you take a look at the web and the web today, uh, the best the web can do so far is to reach um, all people on Earth, let's say, uh, on Twitter, for instance, but with only 140 characters. That's actually uh, uh, less than what TV can do. And when, when you take a look at the, a country such as Brazil, which is so huge, it's actually impressive that uh, with a simple broadcast signal, we can reach hundreds of millions of people at the same time. So TV has been a success, perhaps not from day one, but I, mean, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't born at the time, I'm afraid, but uh, everyone around as, as a TV set or uh, used to have one. And the TV industry has been working on improving the user experience over the years. Uh, typically, they have started to broadcast uh, metadata along with the, the audio and video uh, signal. So that was used for uh, closed captioning initially, uh, electric pro program guides, 
known as EPG nowadays, and uh, some kind of a side content uh, called teletext. It has other names in different uh, regions of the world. Uh, so teletext is a, uh, I mean, it's a it's a fun one teletext. I, I was joking the other day with uh, some kind of a, some a, a set top box manufacturer in Germany. Uh, and I, I was saying that I had always thought that teletext was a, an invention meant to teach people where the exit key is on their TV remote, because well, usually it's uh, it starts from uh, from nowhere. You're just uh, watching TV, and suddenly uh, something you you press the wrong button, and teletext appears, and you're just there. Oh, oh, oh how do I get out of there? And you that's where that's when you learn the uh, that the exit button is a. Uh, uh, is useful on a TV remote, but actually the the guy replied that so the teletext has been abandoned in uh, in many countries, but not all. And he replied that actually uh, it's still being used and quite uh, heavily used in some regions because it serves its pro its purpose pretty well. Uh, it is very highly focused on content. If you come to look at the the screen, for instance, here, it is very simple to navigate. You have three digits per page. And you click on the three digits, and you get taken to that to that page. That's very easy, and it's very focused. And so the, I guess the uh, that sh that should teach us a lesson here, meaning uh, content and user experience are key to success of any system, uh, and fancy visual uh, effects not so much, uh, except as VG of course, Doug. Uh, so you you can find many similar systems, many similar examples, uh, probably in uh, in video games if you're not too uh, too young. Uh, Tetris, Lemmings, uh, the first version of Worms uh, were all very bad looking games if you uh, think about them, and uh, yet they were just uh, 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 among the best games ever made. So that's analog TV, and then digital came in. Uh, so I realized that actually that picture doesn't have any uh, legend. So the legend is uh, uh, basically read the switch to digital TV has been done. Uh, yellow, it is ongoing. Uh, green, it is upcoming. And there's a short blue over there. It's North Korea. Apparently, they have decided not to switch to digital TV at all. But uh, I suppose that will change in the, in the future. I hope so. So uh, anyway, the, the transition to tele digital television is uh, happening everywhere and should be done by uh, 2020, basically. So we are moving to the digital age, for sure. So again, it's interesting to see that different systems were used. Uh, here's another map of the world. So you have DVB in Europe, ATSC in Northern America, ISDB in Japan, derived in ISDB uh, TB in Brazil, and uh, you have another system in China called the DTMB, I think. So uh, 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 as before, it's not surprising that different systems exist since transition to digital TV uh, is also a national or regional in some cases. It's a national thing with different timelines. Uh, and and usually there's a good reason why uh, a, a specific region chose a specific uh, technology. So for instance, I, I didn't know why Brazil has, had chosen to base its uh, broadcasting, digital broadcasting system on uh, uh, what is initially a Japanese technology. So I asked a, a, a Brazilian expert recently why that was the case. And uh, if I understand things correctly, but it's a bit... Uh, it's a bit technical, so maybe I missed something. Uh, it was it, it's it, the reason is that the physical layer, where you can in ISDB multiplex uh, different broadcast signals uh, within the same packet, basically, and it's not possible to do that, for instance, in in DVB used in Europe. And if you dig a little bit, you realize that it's not possible in uh, in DVB because uh, in DVB the laws were such that uh, it didn't make any sense to do that because you had to get two different licenses for these two different uh, to to broadcast two different seg signals, and you couldn't uh, broadcast them together. So by law, it was forbidden. 
So DVB didn't uh, didn't support that uh, technical requirement. And actually, it turns out that the next version of DVB will support that, but it's too late. I mean, we have different systems throughout the world. So anyway, uh, let's take a, a step back and see where we are here. So uh, what I try to describe here is a is a is a technology with a lot of uh, public infrastructure and a lot of regulations at the national level. Uh, it's it's somewhat closed world, meaning that the speci the technical specifications are typically produced or were typically produced. Things are getting better behind closed doors. Uh, there's a lot of lobbying involved. Uh, there are patents, there are licenses, there are all sorts of things. I mean, it's a whole business, it's a whole economy, uh, and it's a, a an economy that lasts uh, that has been around for uh, a lot of time, basically. So um, let's leave TV and uh, let's switch to the web. In comparison, the the web is somewhat young. Uh, the web turns 25 this year. It's a young technology. It was uh, invented in 1989 by Tim Berners-Lee. And it really started to take shape, I would say, uh, around 1995. And it really started to take over the world uh, at the end of the 90s. So in any case, it came into existence uh, at least 40 years after TV was introduced. So pretty young technology compared to TV. The web is based on uh, HTTP requests and answers. So you have a client server architecture. Uh, there is no notion of broadcast on the web. Even when someone's, I mean, even when you talk about broadcasting on the web, actually it's, you talk about streaming and it's not a, a broadcasting thing. So at best the, the web can fake broadcast with streaming, but there's no broadcast signal. So you cannot reach everyone at the same time with the same content. It's not exactly designed for that. Actually, if you take a look at the definition of the web in the uh, fantastic architecture of the World Wide Web Volume 1, which uh, I strongly recommend for uh, uh, bedtime, uh, the web is defined as an information, in information space in which the items of interest are identified by URLs. And so, well, even in, in that definition, I mean, uh, the items of interest can be anything. But in practice, the web was all about static documents and links between those static documents initially. Of course, you all know that things have changed. And now uh, uh, the web is no longer just a, a boring static document platform. It's an app platform. It's something where you can develop uh, rich interactive applications. And it's even more than that. It has become the app platform. So. Uh, it is the app platform because even when you target uh, native devices, I mean native environment, usually uh, you will uh, use web technologies and just wrap them in some kind of native scheme. That's often the case. So it's really uh, has become the app platform. And uh, that's not surprising. I mean, the, the web is worldwide. It doesn't have any frontier. It is available anywhere, anytime and on any device, of course. Uh, it should be noted that the, the web is an imperfect platform. First of all, it is incomplete. Uh, there are many ongoing works. Uh, so for instance, you could have uh, service workers, web RTC. There are ongoing works. It's not done yet. Uh, they're not finished. So the, the, the platform is incomplete. But that's not the that's not what I really meant by imperfect. What I meant is that it's a it's a human platform. Uh, so even if the HTML5 logo seems to indicate that it's a it's a Superman platform and uh, has a uh, superpowers, uh, it's a it's a human platform uh, made by humans all over the world for humans all over the world. Uh, that's uh, not a bug. That's a feature that makes what makes it absolutely fantastic to be uh, uh, to be part of W3C. But it has, of course, uh, uh, drawback in the sense that the 
technology may not always be perfect. Um, so one key aspect of the web uh, that is often uh, of uh, no particular interest to web developers that, that really matters in practice in the each time you go to some company that makes business somewhere is that web components come with a, a, a royalty-free license. So anyone is free to use the, to implement the standard uh, and it's, uh, the, the licensing situation is pretty clear and it's free. And that's, that's pretty good and, and to be, uh, again, something you should bear in mind when you think about the web and TV because the, what I described for TV is just the exact opposite, basically. Well, so anyway, no, now I'm more interested uh, in the web as a, a TV platform. So it turns out that, uh, that uh, HTML5 introduces audio and video elements at last. Uh, and so videos are, have now become first-class citizens on the web. Uh, it took some time. Things are still being adjusted as we speak. Uh, in part um, due to inputs from the uh, from the TV community, and that's good. Uh, but it's uh, the, the introduction of video in on the web changes everything. Uh, so on top, that means you can of course do all store all sorts of uh, fancy effects on top of the video, which is good. It's no longer a black box uh, handled by a plugin, and it's also pretty useful because that means uh, content providers can really start to think of the web as a, the platform, the delivery platform that they're, they, they're, they may be dreaming about. And actually, it's, it's already happening in practice. So for instance, I, I think Netflix is in Brazil as well. So Netflix streams content on the web. And if you take a recent uh, version of your browser, and uh, ironically, or perhaps surprisingly, it means uh, uh, Internet Explorer 11, actually, here. Um, you will have a 100% web experience when you watch Netflix. And traditional broadcasters have also joined the group. I mean, most French TV channels have a website where you can watch the channel live directly from your browser. Uh, so, it, it, of course, it allows them to sell uh, additional services such as video on demand or uh, uh, goodies or whatever. So we left TV at the digital age, uh, but it has now moved forward, of course. It hasn't stopped at just being digital. And one of the things that all uh, the TV industry is looking at is uh, how to make things more interactive. And so ITV stands for interactive TV, that simply. And so the web should be the platform of choice for all um, ITV platforms around the world. It would seem very natural to use web technology to construct such a such a such a platform. So let's take a look at the main ITV platform that exists throughout the world. Uh, they have fancy name in Brazil. You have something called Jinga. Uh, in Europe, we have something called HBB TV. Well, in some countries of Europe, I mean. In Japan, there's something called hybrid cast. Uh, in the United States or in Northern America, you have OCAP. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, uh, all of, basically all of these uh, platforms were uh, are, are, are tailored specifically for one of the uh, transmission system that I talked about before, DVB, ISDB. ATSC, that kind of stuff. So if I take a look at the same list, but uh, restricted to platform that are based on web technologies, uh, that excludes a number of them. And what remains basically do two platforms, HPB TV and hybrid cast that are really similar. And again, it shouldn't be surprising here uh, because uh, the web, although it is now the, uh, the app platform was not the app platform uh, 10 years ago. And the definitions of the ITV platforms were not, uh, were uh, started before that. So for instance, MHP is basically the first platform to have been specified and was around 2000. At the time, so at the time web applications were not a reality. 
And so it's no surprise to hear that this MHP platform was rather based on Java. And it seems actually the, the platform was extremely well designed. From a technical perspective, it really did the job. It really did what it had to do. And it could, it could really have taken Europe and all over the world and the, the whole world. I mean, it could, have a, it could have been the platform and it actually been deployed in many countries initially. Uh, but then, it, unfortunately, a pool of companies uh, that had patents around the around the MHP platform decided to unit together and to uh, knock on the broadcaster's doors and start to say, hey, we have a few patents, so maybe you, you'd like to license our technologies to, to use our, our technology. So you, maybe you want to make a little check or something. Uh, and so broadcasters started to be afraid that uh, the using this platform might uh, cost a lot. So they, they, they started to stop you. They dropped, they dropped support for uh, uh, the MHP platform and they started to work on something else. And that's something else. That's one of the reasons why HBB TV came into existence. I'm really oversimplifying things here. It's not the only reason and probably perhaps not the main one, but still. Uh, so um, uh, even, even though IPR, IPR holders of the MHP uh, technology have now decided that they didn't want to charge anything. Uh, the, uh, the, the the broadcasters just decided to drop to, to switch to something else. I mean, it was too late. And actually, it's not the first time that a similar situation uh, happened in the history of the web. Uh, actually, initially, uh, there was a, a kind of alternative to the World Wide Web called, called Gopher. And Gopher uh, was, I mean, disappeared or almost disappears disappeared because of licensing concern. It's because uh, the university, I think, that uh, uh, developed Gopher uh, had some patents and never it was never clear, clear enough that it would uh, give Gopher for free. And so that, uh, that, that explained why the World Wide Web took up and why, the, uh, and why Gopher just collapsed. So it happens from time to time, and so is uh, a licensing problem. It's a bit sad, perhaps, to hear to I mean to realize that uh, the HBB TV or perhaps the broadcast and the I mean that the, the ITV platform that are based on web technology are not based on web technologies because they are the best ones, but because they are the uh, free ones. But I mean that's life, and actually it's a good thing. So um, just a short word on Jinga. Jinga is used in Brazil. To some extent, it is based on web technology. I mean, it uses a, a, a specific XML language and um, and some Java, of course. But it's uh, still markup. So I mean, it's uh, it's it's close at least. So anyway, um, while there are different platforms available, since it's interesting to realize that they have many. Things in common, in particular, they are they basically all transport audio, video, and data using MPEG-2 TS transport stream. TS stands for transport stream, and they use uh, uh, several uh, technologies uh, taken from MHP, uh, basically everywhere. And dependence on the transmission system, ISDB, ATSC, DVB, is really not a hard one. So there's a way to create a hybrid world, to create a, a common. ITV platform that would be just the ITV platform. Um, so are you still with me? Can you raise your hand if you are? Okay, I see. I see. Wonderful. I see. Twenty people are still with me. Good. I hope the the other ones I haven't slept, uh, haven't uh, fallen asleep. Um, uh, so this is where we start to do things interesting. We start to mix to get things together, and let's. Uh, create a hybrid world. So I, uh, I mean, first I, I talked about existing ITV platform. I talked about the web. I talked about the ITV platforms that could be, uh, I, uh, no, I talked, I'm sorry. I talked about how the ITV platform could be based on web technologies, but I did not address the key question being, why should we do that? Just because we can, um, that's not a uh, good reason, in, 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 uh, good enough reason, I, I think. So, well, actually, we know the answer already. I mentioned it with teletext. It's all about content, the user experience, and the most direct outcome of that being money. Um, actors of the TV industry, so they are part of a race to improve the user experience and to uh, to, to to ensure that the they, they can emerge the user into 
into into into um, I mean that they can engage the user into immersive experiences. And so that's what they call it smart TV. It's smart TV as opposed to dumb TV. And dumb TV is where you just have your TV remote and switch from channel to channel. Uh, so I had a, a good demo to show. It's, uh, it's the Japanese system, but it's a video. So I would prefer actually not to, de to, 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 to play the video because I don't know if the, the link that we have is going to support it. So I'm going to describe the picture of the video. And you have, you'll have to think about the, the video by yourself. Or you can find it on the on the web pretty easily. So uh, it's a picture of the hybrid cast system deployed in Japan, and as you can see, it's a football match. So the TV remote in this case is is, is a tablet. So it's a secondary device. It has a rich user interface. On the TV, you can see that there are some player statistics on the right the bottom right uh, corner. And uh, well, it's easy to imagine that the user can choose on his tablet the statistics that he wants. He wants to be displayed on the TV, and you can imagine a gesture where the user just to swipe the content and it go, it sends it to the TV. Additionally, the names of the player, players could be displayed on top of each of the player. That's just a kind of simple interactive thing where you just add data on top of video. On the tablet, the, 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 the user could perhaps select another camera an angle. There are many different cameras used when you in a, in a football game, and perhaps they can be exposed to the tablet, or perhaps they can be just the, the user could just switch to another uh, uh, camera on, on his TV as well. So the key point in time, with the possibility to migrate content from one device to the other. And if you migrate device from one of that one well, if you migrate content from one device to the other, the only way you can do that is if the two devices speak the same language, so use the same technologies. So one thing that is not addressed in the video, but you could dream about, is you could actually imagine a system where, with just a click from the tablet, uh, you replace one of the player with uh, your avatar on Wii or your Xbox avatar, whatever. And suddenly, look, now you're, you're Neymar playing against uh, against uh, someone in real time. That could be fantastic. And it's actually doable from a technological perspective. So if we, if I take a look at, uh, uh, at it from another angle, uh, I apologize for the drawings. That's me drawing, and that's the best I can do. Uh, so uh, there's a, a user on the top left. Uh, he's at work. Uh, and he, he sees in uh, his Twitter feed that uh, someone shares something about a TV series. So he goes to the, he follows the link, uh, goes to the website, see that the he can watch an episode of the of the TV series, decides to watch it, uh, realize that it's actually quite a good series. So decided to switch over to the TV, and all of that should be seamless, should just work correctly without uh, him, uh, without the user having to think too much. And then later on, you can get back to the same site and realize that actually the, the new episode is being broadcasted at the time, at the same time. And so you can start looking, watching it, uh, watching the episode on the website, and then again switch uh, to a TV. And the rest of the scenario is exactly the same as uh, what I just mentioned before. So here are the, the key is that you start from TV, and there's no reason why you wouldn't start from T. Well, you start from the web. I'm sorry. Uh, and my perspective is that more and more you will switch to TV from the web. So you will uh, you will be browsing the web as usual, searching things, looking at uh, uh, Twitter updates, whatever, and you will follow links as the web has always done. Uh, and uh, you will get to TV from the web and not the opposite way around. So anyway, to create the 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 goal the goal here is that. Uh, uh, you, we want to merge broadcast and broadband. Broadcast is the TV, broadband is the internet connection. And you want to merge both things. And that's precisely the goal. So what, what is in an ITV platform spec? So if you take a deeper look, and we're entering technical details, but I'm sure you'll, you'll love it. Uh, if you take a deeper look at an ITV platform specification, you'll find things about around app signaling and life cycle. So it's uh, how do you signal? How do how does the broadcast signal 
say that there is an application that could be started, a companion application that could be started at the same time that the video is being watched. You have some way to identify the, 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 the channel and to control it. Uh, there's a, a way to map the streams to HTML media elements. And there's a lot of profiling there, meaning that you will see that the, uh, the, the specification will say you have to, to be a TV receiver that uh, is compatible with my platform. You need to support this uh, version of MPEG Dash. MPEG Dash is for adaptive streaming over HTTP. Uh, and there are different extension APIs that could be referenced. So uh, it's all interesting, but I'm, I'm looking at it from a, from a web perspective. And I'm wondering, I mean, couldn't the ITV platform of tomorrow, the common one, be just the web? I mean, that's what we want. We don't want a separate world. We just want one world. And the one world is one web. Remember, it's the our philosophy at the British AC, So it's just one web. So what is missing from it? So good news is that there are ongoing uh, work that uh, will help close the gap. So for instance, uh, an application that needs to, so imagine now that the TV is your web browser. So uh, you switch on your TV. If it's on a real TV set, you're going to, it, it's going to show some broadcast video. We'll get back to it. If it's on the, uh, a laptop, you're not going to, it's going to show a blank page and you're going to enter, for instance, the URL of a broadcast signal. Why not? Or you're going to access some kind of web page that has access to the broadcast signal. And to have access to the broadcast signal, you need some kind of API. Well, good news is there are some ongoing works. It's not standardization ready yet, but it's ongoing, done by Mozilla in particular, uh, for a TV tuner API. Uh, I'm, I'm going to skip over the rest because I think in the interest of time, I shouldn't spend too much time on this, but um, they, there are, the, these are ongoing works that are meant to address uh, current gaps in the, uh, in the web architecture that uh, enable supporting TV scenarios. But it, it raises a few interesting questions. One of them is, uh, what does it mean to uh, have a video playing in a web browser. If I go to some, uh, if I enter the URL of an actual video on my web browser, it's an MP4, for instance, video. Uh, what I see is that the all web browsers will play the video, but that's not defined anywhere. That's not specified anywhere. What is specified is what the browser does when it gets some HTML content. It renders, it creates a DOM structure, a DOM tree, and it renders the HTML content. But if it's a video, actually all of the web browser will actually wrap the video in some kind of HTML page, a fake one, and will play the video within that page. But that uh, context is not defined anywhere. And if we are to merge uh, broadcast and broadband, we probably need to do something here. We probably need to specify what happens and how to interact with the uh, browsing context of a video. And interestingly enough, the same problem arises in other contexts, even if we're not talking about the convergence between web and TV. So for, for instance, there's ongoing work on a second screen presentation API. It's something where you can say, okay, I want to open that web page on the second screen. And uh, if you do that, well, it's going to be, and then you can send, me, communicate, and send message to that second uh, second screen, basically to that uh, to that second screen. And if you do that with an HTML page, well, that's that's easy because you have JavaScript running on the on both sides. But if you do that with a video, well, actually, you you're not going to send comments to a video. That doesn't mean anything. You want to send comment to perhaps the video player that that has to be specified and will have to specify it. So it's an interesting question. And it probably will be answered some, some, somehow. There are a few other open questions around application signaling and supported profiles. Uh, W3C, as I said, is one web. So we have, uh, we usually try to stay away from profiling because we, we have the feeling that it fragments the web. And so it creates different webs and we just want one. So I don't know what will happen with these gaps. We'll see future will tell. And there are a few tough issues. 
uh, most of these scenarios uh, involve synchronization of contents between different devices. Uh, so in the NHK uh, demo, for instance, you you want to synchronize things across devices, but it's uh, 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 it's not easy. There's no easy way to do this, especially if it's video that needs to be synchronized. So perhaps we just need to expose some kind of a synchronized clock to web pages so that they can communicate the clock and synchronize their clocks together and exchange messages based on that. It may not be that complex. Uh, another tough issue is latency. Uh, I mentioned the live football match where you could perhaps switch to another camera angle. But if the camera, uh, the different camera angle is actually, uh, I mean, you have only one broadcast signal. So if the broadcast signal is one camera, if the, the other camera angles are uh, broad, uh, uh, streamed over the internet, you'll have a latency. It's very hard to stream live content over the internet without losing precious seconds. And we're talking about uh, dozens of seconds here because uh, the way you stream over the internet is using adaptive streaming, is using Dash typically. Uh, so adaptive streaming over the internet, over, over HTTP. And that takes some time. In the, the content needs to be pushed to CDN, content, uh, uh, content networks. And uh, so it introduces a delay. And uh, you really don't want to watch uh, uh, a football match uh, 30 seconds after the others. So it's a bit difficult. So anyway, uh, I'm, I'm I'm basically done. What I wanted to show to show in that uh, in, uh, in in that presentation is that uh, there is on um, there there are two different worlds. We have the TV on the one hand. We have the uh, the web on the second hand. They are very different. They have different rules. They have different actors. They have different uh, expectations and different needs. But we're moving them together, and the convergence is happening right now, and it's good. And it only works because people are around the table, and, uh, and uh, it only works if people are around the table. So some of what I described as ongoing possibilities may not, uh, may not come to life in the end. It all depends on support from uh, actual uh, actors of the TV world and of the web world. So we'll see what happens. As developers or as technicians, you can help. You can develop apps for the hybrid world. I mean, for lack of a better name, actually, it's just the web. Uh, you can point out missing technical gaps or contribute IDs. But the first point is prob probably the, the best one in my view. Show what you can do if you had a broadcast signal in a web app and imagine the, the future experience. Uh, I'm done. I'm, I see that I'm five minutes late, so I'm sorry. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for listening. I really, uh, again, I apologize for not being with you. It makes the experience kind of weird. I must say, I don't know what, how it feels on your side. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. Are there any questions? Hello. Hello. Uh, well, thank you, François. E bom, muito obrigado pela participação de todos, agora nós temos um próximo keynote speaker aqui, que já vou fazer o anúncio dele, mas primeiro eu só gostaria de agradecer o François, thank you so much François for helping us to participate in our conference.